All right. So again, welcome to Pine United Methodist Church. It is August 30th. It is what the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. So the longest season, right? Ordinary time is what we're in. And, um, we have, it's, it's also the last Sunday where we're exploring our theme when we face our fears, um, inspired by James Baldwin and also preparing us into uh, times of hope and times of action. And um, yeah, so I hope, that, I hope that we can relish this Sunday in preparation for our theme next month. And um, we'll learn more about that um, this week and especially on Sunday. Um, I've gotten some suggestions from um, John Hawk. What was it? Last Sunday or a couple Sundays ago. And so we're going to uh, use that as a jumping off point for our theme next Sunday. And we will have communion next Sunday. So please remember that as well. And um, after fellowship, we have a, a few things we might want to talk about. One of them being World Communion Sunday. So if you want to um, hear more about that, please stay online after worship this morning. Okay. With that, I invite you now to take this time to be here, to be present in this space, to allow yourselves to just be settled where you are, to feel your body supported by the seat underneath you, by the ground underneath you. Allow yourselves to take in a breath, intentional breath, if you haven't been able to today yet. Let that breath go. Find the natural rhythm of your breath. And I'll read for us our call to worship this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm chapter 105, uh, verses 1 through 6, verses 23 through 26, and then the last part of verse 45. And um, I invite you to take these words in as a meditation for you this morning. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon their name. Make their deeds known to all people. Sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord. Dwell on all their wondrous works. Give praise to God's holy name. Let the hearts rejoice of all those seeking the Lord. Pursue the Lord and their strength. Seek their face always. Remember the wondrous works they have done, all their marvelous works and the justice they declared. You who are the offspring of Abraham, their servant, and the children of Jacob, their chosen ones. We'll have our uh, centering music by Alice Kubel. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
head into our centering, um, or actually our opening prayer this morning. So uh, for our opening prayer, I'm going to invite you to uh, put your hands on your hearts or on the center of your chest. Uh, this is a prayer for holiness of heart. It's written by Howard Thurman. And so, um, yeah, it's just a way for us to kind of recognize what's going on for us inside and also uh, prayers for, uh, to kind of set the tone for our worship this morning. All right. Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. Here's the citadel of all my desiring, where my hopes are born, and all the deep resolutions of my spirit take wings. In this center, my fears are nourished, and all my hates are nurtured. Here, my loves are cherished, and all the deep hungers of my spirit are honored, without quivering and without shock. In my heart above all else, let love and integrity envelop me until my love is perfected and the last vestige of my desiring is no longer in conflict with thy spirit. Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. Amen. We'll have our first hymn, Holy Ground. Howard Thurman. That line is not the whole. <laughs> Somebody's mute. Someone is not muted. I'm going to ask you to please mute yourselves. Um, I can hear whatever conversation is happening in the background there. Um, all right. Just so that we can focus on our message time here. Um, our scripture reading today is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. It was too long to put in the worship bulletin, but I'm going to read it for us here. And I'm going to be reading from the Common English Bible. All right. Moses was taking care of the flock for his father-in-law, Jethro, Midian's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert and came to, the gods, came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it didn't burn up. Then Moses said to himself, let me check out this amazing sight and find out why the bush isn't burning up. When the Lord saw that he was coming to look, God, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, I'm here. Then the Lord said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. He continued, I am the God of your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land that's full of milk and honey, a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live. 
Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed me. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you, and this will show you, and this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and, the, and worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I now come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they are going to ask me, What's this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God continued, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how all generations will remember me. And um, we will have a video uh, since we're closing out our theme here when we face our fears. We're going to have uh, James Baldwin, Baldwin be the last word uh, for us this Sunday. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. So um, wrapping up with uh, James Baldwin inspiring our theme, when we face our fears, there's a lot in his words about facing the reality of what um, our country is actually like and what our world is actually like, and also uh, facing the realities of the histories of before and having to accept and contend with those histories, right? Along with being able to talk about history and the current situation, there's also a conversation of where we are as individuals and as a community, right, where we are in these times, especially um, as we think of new leadership coming uh, for our country in November, hopefully, right, because we don't know what will happen after that. Um, so the story of Moses is one that's very much about identity, is very much one about history, right? We're talking about someone who didn't know who he really was or what his, who his ancestors were until he was, you know, grown up enough to run away and survive while being gone and away in the wilderness. And so um, I think that this journey for uncovering history and facing history and therefore uncovering who we are uh, it's an ongoing journey, and I think that being able to have Moses, the story of Moses and the story of Exodus accompany us in that is, um, you know, I think, I think it will help us to learn from our spiritual ancestors in that way. So for this Sunday, I had sent out uh, five uh, reflection points, and we don't have to use them, or you can. Um, it's just kind of to help us get our you know, get the juices flowing and, and bringing our uh, collective message together. All right, so the first point in today's reading, God communicates and manifests in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. Does our experience of annual and increasingly intense wildfires change or challenge how we interpret Moses' encounter with God? Second point in today's reading, God says to Moses, so get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What would be the political economic impact on Egypt? Could God be planning to overturn an oppressive system? And then third point, Moses and God have an initial conversation in which Moses expresses his hesitations and concerns in being part of this plan to liberate the people. Given what we know about Moses, what could be keeping him from enthusiastically facing this call from God? And if you were in the place of Moses, would the conversation go differently or would you also have hesitations? Four, how might this text be speaking to facing fears? How does the story play out when worries, fears, challenges, or harsh truths are faced? Which characters resonate most with you and why? And the last point, how is this text relevant for us today? How might it inform how we move through the world as people of faith and in our ministry? So I'm gonna let you all sit with that for a little bit. 
um, as we gather our reflections. I'm going to share a little bit of mine. Um, I really do. I think I've said this. I've said this probably plenty of times. I really do like the stories of the Old Testament because they're very complex, you know. Um, they're very human, I guess, right? Um, and and Moses has this back and forth with God, and I find it to be really interesting. I have a friend that said that, that preached on this text and she titled it, um, God's butt is bigger than your butt. Meaning Moses raised butts, right? Like when God said this, Moses, but then Moses said that. And then God said this, but then Moses said that, right? Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. And that title has stuck with me. Uh, it's a really good one. So I think this text is... I mean, it can allude to facing those things, facing our, for better lack of terms, facing our butts, facing our hesitations, facing those things that, that, that get in the way of being able to um, follow God more closely or to walk with God more closely, right? Um, I also wanted to point out that this is a very, it has a very important line here, right, where God says, I am who I am. Some people call this like the Popeye text, right? I am who I am. Um, and it's also known as the te tetragrammaton, tetragrammaton. Yeah, that, that I am who I am. So in Hebrew, it's spelled out Y-H-W-H, right? Some people say Yahweh. Um, and some actually there's a, a feminist a theologian who talks about how there is no gender in that I am who I am. And some people translate that text to say he who is. But since there's no gender, it could actually be read as she who is. And so it's interesting to think about God identifying God's self that way. That, um, you know, just stating, I'm just here. <laughs> I'm, I am. I exist, you know. And so uh, there's a lot of conversation to hear about name, God naming God's self, but also we were talking about Moses last Sunday and God's, uh, Moses' name as well. Um, and thinking about how the Pharaoh's daughter, right? In the text, we are assuming that the Pharaoh's daughter is giving Moses a Hebrew name because, you know, they said that she called him Moses to mean drawn out of the water. But we have to remember that the Pharaoh's daughter was Egyptian, right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that she's using a Hebrew name to name Moses. Um, there are uh, Hebrew Pharaohs that have Moses at the end, right? Tutmosis, uh, Ramses, that cis part, you know, people think that that's um, Egyptian. And so it's interesting how our Hebrew text is trying to reclaim or redefine Moses' name, right? So anyway, those are some things I just wanted to lay out for us for our conversation today. And I'm going to open it now for any thoughts, reflections, anything that stands out for you this morning with this story. Well, I, I see that the uh, fire as a symbol of renewal. And I think the burning bush is more of a symbolism of a spiritual renewal in Moses' heart. And, and obviously when it comes to fire, uh, the old, there has to be destruction for the new to come. And uh, I think what God asked Moses to do is a lot of that is just like what happened to uh, the southern state in after the civil war. The, the, it required the southern reconstruction. It's uh, it obviously caused the total destructions to the uh, economy to the southern state. And I think even after the civil war, there was the plan for the Southern Reconstruction, but even now as of today, the South is still remaining poverty. And, and that's a pretty tough decisions, uh, pretty tough actions to take, especially for Moses who grew up in Egypt 
and that was pretty much in many ways his home. And he know what is the consequence of his action. And for even here in the state, I mean, that's also one of the reasons why we have the electoral college system is to accommodate the reconstruction of the southern state. Thanks for sharing, Ron. I didn't know that about the electoral college. Yeah, the um, southern states were not going to join the um, United States unless they had more power in relation to their um, population. So that's why Electoral College, it's not a winner take all system. Thanks, Edie. So we're still living with that. <laughs> That in which we don't have a winner take all presidential system. The civil war continues. Um, I just want to make two quick comments. When I think about the fires, um, I remember when we had the weekend of the thunderstorms and um, the day after, you know, I was talking about it with my family and my dad in a very Christian um, perspective, I guess, was just like talking about how, you know, God reveals, you know, himself through nature and how powerful God is and how, you know, loving God is that God only displays a fraction of his power through the thunderstorms and how he, amazed he was at the thunderstorms. But while he was going off about it, I, in my head, I'm like, but I feel like there's going to be wildfires now. And um, which means people will have to evacuate, um, you know, and I think it's kind of gotten me to think about how I view quote unquote, God's power through nature. Um, I do think it is something to revere and, you know, be in awe of, you know, but I can't also help but think of the, you know, the natural consequences that happen after, you know, like, of course, I recognize, you know, lightning and thunder is powerful. Of course, I recognize storms are powerful. But when I think, especially like in the Philippines, when I think of all the different typhoons that hit the Philippines and, you know, all of the displacement of people that happens, the lack of the government's response to bringing aid, um, you know, I it does put a, I guess, it does give me a bitter taste um, when I associate God with these things and I'm still trying to figure out how to move on from there. Um, but then when I think about the, so I'm just gonna leave that there um, for the second point, thinking about what God is calling Moses to do. Um, I just kind of think of if that was happening today, I would, I would be thinking if, you know, God came to, um, you know, uh, a Latino worker in the farm or um, basically any immigrant, you know, working anything here in the United States. Um, and God speaking to them and saying, I want you to take my people out of here. And I just thinking of like how much the United, how much the America's economy would suffer if God came to all the immigrant population said, I want you out of here. And they all left. Um, like how much the US like would suffer because of, or the economic system would suffer because of that. Um, and I think that's because thinking of what the Israelites are doing for the Egyptians, basically building their empire. You know, I'm like, wow, like, that's asking a lot of Moses. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. Thanks, Aaron. All right, May has written here, like Moses, I would have and do felt fear and of self-doubt. Pausing to pray and meditate can bring me in touch with God and provide me with the encouragement to go forward in spite of my fear. 
Thanks for sharing that, May. All right, and we have uh, sharing from John as well. Might Saul's, Paul's experience with the burning bush inform our understanding of Moses's experience of the burning bush? Are there similarities or differences that can help with our understanding of the two? That's a good question. Thanks, John. Um, I was watching a, sp a speech on CNN um, made by Martin Luther King Jr. III um, this week. Um, you know, uh, in, during, after the commitment march uh, in Washington, D.C., and um, one of the things he said was, um, you know, if you're looking for a savior, you know, look at yourself in the mirror. I was really struck by that. You know, I think we we often wait wait around for, you know, like larger than life figures to come and and uh, you know uh, just start leading leading us. You know, and uh, there's so many so many reasons to think that we cannot make it make any difference. Um, and it, that reminded me of Moses. You know, in front of the fire. Think, you know, having all these self doubts and and um, and of course, as some of us have shared, you know, we have a lot of fears too, and and um, the sense of inadequacy in the face of all all the things that's happening. But um, yeah, and I was also reminded of the the Chadwick Boseman, the actor who played the Black Panther, you know, who passed away this week as well of cancer. Um, in a way, he was like, he was sort of like a Moses figure, in, in, you know, for the black community and for a lot of people, you know, and, in, and I didn't realize how much he was struggling with his own cancer. And he knew how, how important his role was in this movie for a large segment of our population. And um, so in a way, he, he was like a Moses figure. But I guess I just want to you know, really meditate on, on the Martin Luther King's uh, admon admonition for us to look at the mirror when we're looking for a savior. Thank you, Philip. I'd, I'd really like to echo that um, because what I think this scripture speaks to so much is the calling in all of us. I think God calls all of us not just um, who we perceive as leaders. Um, you know, of course I'm going to vote for Joe Biden, but I don't see him as this great savior. I think that's a, um, you know, um, I didn't see Obama that way either, although I had a lot of hope for him, but I think, I think that is um, a mistake that, that, that a lot of um, Democrats put you know, in this, I think the, the saviors are ourselves that we are called all of us to do. And we've seen this, you know, that simple people, humble people are changing things um, by marching, by feeding the hungry, by um, writing letters. We can all do this. Uh, um, I remember when I, when I was first taking a lay speaking course, I, I said, I, I really didn't want to take this course. I didn't, I never wanted to be a lay speaker, but it was um, the intern at Pine, Cody Case, who encouraged me to take this course with him. And I did say, I think it was to Dale Weatherspoon, who was teaching the course, that I don't want to be a spiritual leader. You know, I said that. And he said, he said, well, well then let's rephrase it. Would you be a spiritual servant? And I said, yes, I would. So I think, you know, that we are all servants of God and we are all called, even in reluctance as Moses was. Because most of us are reluctant, yeah? yeah. I think so, yes. Thanks, Margaret and Philip. I echo Margaret's point. I think that we all have various roles. Um, and I think that also what's good about it is also that, um, that if we all take on our, uh, our, I guess, in, our, in a way, our roles, um, 
great change can happen. And I think that um, when we think about the story, and we even expand beyond this initial conversation, it, it isn't just Moses. It's also everyone that followed Moses out of Egypt, taking the call. And so it's, it's really interesting when you bring that back to what Margaret was saying, like some, there will be a, a leader, but we all have our tasks too. And I can always imagine that if Moses did the thing and no one followed, it would have been a really interesting, um, it probably wouldn't have met, uh, been placed in the Bible. Um, so I think that everyone's um, acceptance and movement um, made this successful. And it's also interesting when we think about time span, right? Uh, we have the, the ability to look at it from a huge span of time. And so we see the wonder of, of what happened when these folks said yes, um, that they probably never had an inkling to. So that's, I think, another piece that I always take from this story. Um, but just deviating a little bit, um, going towards uh, one of Pastor Janelle's question about econo um, the economy. Um, yes, I mean, this is, will greatly change um, when basically you have um, folks who work for nothing and who are pushed constantly to do things um, out of uh, the population, then things will go and stop. And I can imagine also the hesitation um, that Moses brings in, in this context, given where he was. But I also wonder, um, is that also necessarily a 100% argument? Because when I think about today, given the, the wealth distribution, is it possible for everyone to be paid justly and still run smoothly? if we all start adjusting salaries, compensation, what have you. Um, so I, I kind of challenge that statement as well. Like if we were going and reshuffling resources, it, will there be enough? And I, I, I kind of think that there is. <laughs> when I think about all the billionaires <laughs> that we have, I mean, can there be a world where things are fair and we can still move forward. Um, I don't know, just bring that out there. Thanks, Don. The part of the process of trying to make a fair world is to acknowledge that history created an unfair world to begin with through um, not necessarily through slavery, but through the systems that um, perpetuated the unfairness like redlining and um, uh, private policing or policing that discriminates against people of color and through military adventurism that, in, that protected um, exploitation of wealth all around, uh, uh, in third world countries. And to re recognize that is part of the system that we need to um, dismantle um, and acknowledge that it is, is systemic. And I think that's part of the um, issues that are coming to light now. Um, and it's mainly coming to light now through um, improved communication uh, in, in a way. Thanks, Edie. Any other final thoughts, maybe from folks we haven't heard from yet? Okay, if not, then um, I thank everybody for, for lifting up those things. I like this idea. I didn't hear that speech, but I like the idea of looking in the mirror for your savior. Um, a lot of times I think that sometimes we forget that God does reside with us. And um, sometimes um, 
Christians might look in other places for their savior, someplace outside, someplace external, when really we also have a responsibility to um, also, you know, follow the divine, not just look for the divine and then ask him to do something, but to um, invite the divine into different places, to invite the divine into ourselves. And, um, you know, we only know God because of how God works through human history, how God works through humans, you know, through the experience of humans. And so I think that uh, we need to remember that when we're talking about change in the world, um, I think looking in the mirror also reminds me of this thing again with identity. Uh, who does Moses identify with now uh, in this moment of speaking, of having this encounter with God in the burning bush? And who does God identify with, you know, in this moment as well, in this conversation, in this exchange? That's not to say that God has no compassion for uh, the Egyptians at that time. Um, but, you know, there is injustice and God is urging liberation to happen, is urging justice to happen. And um, who does, on top of that, who does Pharaoh identify with? You know, we've talked about it a few times here that in the context of empires and powerful empires, the leaders were seen as almost synonymous with God or synonymous with the divine, right? So Pharaoh, for him to stand up and, and you know, we'll see in the story for Pharaoh to push away Moses's, you know, um, Moses's God is not just about belief, is not just about faith, but it's about this whole, whole way of engaging with the world for the Pharaoh as well, you know, not to, you know, I'm not trying to, well, I'm just trying to understand the Pharaoh situation a little bit more, just because we don't get, uh, we don't get to hear what happened to, to him. And so um, I think that when we're talking about uh, who we identify as our saviors, who we identify as our community, and how do we connect with our history, right? Like some people might think that the history of oppressed peoples is other people's history and not ours. That the history of people who are oppressing are other people's history and not ours, right? But these are all things that inform us and have informed where we are here and now. And we need to be able to own those things and face those things to be able to proclaim again who we are as individuals and who God made us um, to be. I mentioned before Moses's name of um, Moses, meaning drawn out of the water, right? Even if it was an Egyptian name, some people would interpret it as Moses, child of the Nile, right? So it has to do with this water. It has to do with being drawn out. And uh, for some scholars, this name drawn out, that he was drawn out of the water, echoes to some people about what is going to happen with the community, that they're going to be drawn out of this oppressive situation, that they're going to be drawn out and into liberation, right? So I'm wondering for us, as we continue to move forward and head towards um, continue on in this year that's really uncertain for a lot of us and has brought out both the best and the worst of humanity. Um, I'm challenging us, I guess, inviting us to face our butts, face our reluctance, face our hesitations, face those things that make us feel like we are not in control of things, face those realities and how facing our butts can actually allow liberation to be drawn out of us and into um, our lives, how liberation can then be drawn out of ourselves and into our communities, how liberation can be drawn out of us and into the world. You know, there is a, there's a lot to be drawn out of us, good things, not just bad things or, uh, you know, things that are not as positive. So with that, um, thank you all for sharing in this message, this final message of when we face our fears and being able to face one another and speak these truths with one another. Um, and as we wrap up, Lynn also wrote something in the chat box. I think what is scary for me right now is that there are people who are looking to and really believing that whoever is called the leader with a capital L is the person they believe in without question. But I look to mindfulness to, to help calm my anxieties and then ask myself, what can I do? Yes, that's always the question. What, what can we do? What are we being called to do? And how are we as a community 
being called to enact change in this world. Okay. Um, we can talk about this more after worship this morning, but right now I'm going to invite us to take all of our reflections and all the things that have been raised and all the things that are still within us as well into our time of prayer. And we're going to open up with our song of prayer, Spirit of Gentleness. I'll take this time during our worship service to intentionally connect with God through um, silent prayer, through silent meditation. Stepping out of this time of silent prayer, we uh, open up this space for prayers to be shared aloud before the rest of the community. Also, this will not be, um, I, I edit this out of the recording, so feel free to share whatever or also make announcements too. All right, if there are no more prayers to be lifted up aloud at this time, let us close by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we will step into our time of offering and it's a time for us to um, have some moments of gratitude and graciousness. Um, all right. God of grace and glory, we thank you that you judge us not by the perfection of our actions, but by our readiness to live boldly by faith. Help us as individuals and as a congregation to trust you and follow where you lead, that in Christ your name may be glorified in all the earth. Amen. We have our next hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory.
prepare to leave this space i just want to remind you all that we will have fellowship after worship so if you just want to even just sit here and listen to us go back and forth you're welcome to do so um and who we have been worshiping with today prosper gary nana tom uh, marge and butch aaron anita ann don Edie, john hawk john k uh, k and art kim Michi, Lauren, Margaret, May, Philip, Ron, and Alice. So these are all the folks that we've been worshiping with together in this space. And uh, with that, let us close with this benediction. Go forth in the name of the Creator, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, drawing out liberation into our lives, drawing out liberation into our world, drawing out liberation in those times we encounter one another and those in our world. Amen. All right. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Also, also with you. Also with you. <laughs> See you all next Sunday. Uh, yeah.